This is the America's Quarterly Podcast. I'm Brian Winter. As Claudia Sheinbaum takes office, questions about how she will navigate Mexico's economy, its relationship with the United States, and concerns about the country's institutions. Today on the podcast, an overview of what to expect during the next sexenio. I think that Claudia Sheinbaum has the opportunity to change policy and to shift policy in ways in which is going to change the relationship with the private sector, which was something that was significantly affected during the last six years. And in the hope that that can create a better scheme for investment and for hopefully growth. I was in Mexico in July, and I met with a wide range of people from the opposition, the business community, and the ruling Morena party. What I heard was fairly hopeful, a view that Claudia Sheinbaum would maintain the popular social programs of her predecessor, Andres Manuel López Obrador, known as AMLO, while staking out perhaps a more pragmatic position on issues like green energy, security, and the business climate at large. Sitting here today, well, to be honest, a lot of that optimism is now gone, eroded by the controversial passage of a judicial reform championed by AMLO in the final weeks of his presidency. The reform would essentially fire all of the country's current judges, including the Supreme Court, and shift to a system where Mexican voters directly elect the judiciary, more than 6,500 positions nationwide. The reform is popular, with polls showing a strong majority of the Mexican public supports it, but others worry it will lead to a massive concentration of power in the ruling Morena party. The effect has been quite tough on Mexican financial markets and on the business climate, Some worry it could also endanger Mexico's free trade deal with the United States in upcoming renegotiations. Claudia Sheinbaum, after initially seeming skeptical of the judicial reform, later became a strong advocate, leading some to believe she might not be that different from AMLO after all. Our guest today has an interesting and I think quite nuanced view. Vanessa Rubio had a 25-year career as a public servant in Mexico. She was a senator from the PRI party, now in opposition, and a senior figure in the ministries of finance, foreign affairs, and social development. These days, Vanessa is an associate dean at the London School of Economics. We're proud to feature her as a frequent contributor to America's Quarterly. Vanessa, welcome back to the AQ Podcast. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here with you and, of course, with your audience. So, Vanessa, as I said in the introduction, everyone wants to know the answer to this question of how Claudia Sheinbaum will be different from her predecessor. In your new article for America's Quarterly, you said that her government will likely feature much more state, more market, more technology. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, of course. I think from a very high view, when you see a technocratic government, uh, there used to be less state and more market. When AMLO came in 2018, that shifted significantly with more state, less market. And now when I imagine Claudia Sheinbaum's government, I see both in an increased way. So more state, more concentration of power, as we have seen, because she will have significant powers and also the judiciary reform will give her even more powers. The supermajority will give her more powers. And uh, of course, the overrepresentation gave her more powers. So all of that will be there. But at the same time, there will be more market. So more relationship with the private sector, a shift in in significant structural policies like energy, science and technology, infrastructure, digitalization. So all of that will create, I think, a very unique regime in which all of these characteristics coexist. 
Can you give me a specific example or examples of how that would work? Because usually think of it as being one or the other, right? Almost like a zero sum game where you're on a spectrum and it's either state or the market. How, how in practice can it be both? In practice, it'll be both because, for instance, there will be a, an increased voice, an increased presence, an increased power of the executive vis-a-vis -vis the legislative and vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary. This is going to be a fact. So that is a concentration of power. No, There is going to be a supermajority in the legislative in both chambers, in the deputies chamber and in the Senate. That is a, amassing more power, concentrating more power. But then at the same time, when you have more technocratic capacity, when you have more capacity in general no, to, to execute government, when you're thinking differently, the energy sector, the energy matrix with more uh, renewables, with more investments on the electrical grid and electricity in general, uh, oil and gas as well. But when you think that previous CONACID, which was basically annulled during Andres Manuel López Obrador's government, so that the Science and Technology Institute is going to be upgraded to a new Ministry of Science and Technology, but also they're thinking about regional development with different poles, between 10 and 12 different poles, where they intend to increase it significantly the private investment to create infrastructure, large-scale infrastructure, but also social infrastructure. And when you think about the creation of a new digital agency that will begin with customs, but will also deal with health issues, for instance, all of these things will coexist at the same time. So I imagine that some of our listeners, especially in the private sector, are listening to this and thinking, huh, well, if true, this actually sounds a little bit better than what we saw under Lopez Obrador for the last six years, which, you know, to mention again, some of the quote unquote greatest hits here, there were issues like the spending billions on the refinery, um, closing of the airport, uh, some of these other decisions that were not exactly based in technocracy, <laughs> let's say. I mean, is that your view as well, that on balance, this this alignment that you've just described ends up being somewhat better for business? I think some of it will be better. Some of it won't be better. Just the sole concentration of power, the lack of division of power, checks and balances, the independent and technical institutions being, uh, you know, submitted into the, the ministries. I don't think that is a good thing. So, so the fact that there's a concentration of power, that there might be some more discretionary decisions uh, over the rule of law, I don't think that's a good thing. But at the same time, there will be more capacity and a shift in policies that are key to economic development, to investment. So again, you touched a point that I think is key to understanding Mexico today and Mexico in the future. It is not one or the other. It is not the traditional way of thinking uh, or analyzing political systems. It is all of it coexisting at the same time. So some of it will be uh, more negative and some of it will be more positive. It will depend on which sector, I guess, you do business in Mexico. No, With the common denominator being a very powerful executive. Very, very powerful executive. Vanessa, you have met Claudia Sheinbaum, albeit briefly. What did you see and what's your impression now from afar of who she is and what she wants from her government? I met her briefly once. Uh, we were at a breakfast of, of women leaders uh, that was organized by one of the largest uh, media companies in Mexico. We were seated together, actually. She uh, struck me by the, back then as a bright woman as a, an engaging woman as a as a woman that wanted to to uh, do things for the betterment of of Mexico City back then uh, I haven't been in touch with her since but I've read a lot about what is behind her thinking I read the 100 steps for transformation I've read her press conferences I've read her her proposals for government and what I think is uh, we still need to see her true colors. So we still need to see from October 1st onwards, what is Claudia Sheinbaum going to propose? What is Claudia Sheinbaum going to be as the leader of Mexico, the 12th or 11th, depending on how you count it, largest economy in the world? 
the first trading partner of the U.S., the first source of its imports, a G20 uh, member, but also a very Latin American country. So we're yet to see her true colors and how she will play out in terms of all of the variables and all of the challenges that she will have ahead. Most importantly, and, and that's something I, I, I am concerned about, is the economic environment, the, the public deficit, the fiscal pressures, more social expenditure plans. So how all of this will play out, I think, is going to be a very tricky balance. I was in Mexico City in July, and you know it was that point during the presidential transition, this happens everywhere, where everybody is projecting their hopes upon the person who won the election. <laughs> and you know, you heard a hundred different things from different people who you spoke to. And I, I met with people inside Morena, people from the opposition and so on. And the, uh, the consensus was this view that when it comes to management of the economy in particular, but also clean energy, that she would be somewhat better from their perspective than AMLO. Then came the judicial reform. And my sense is that a lot of the goodwill that was kind of waiting for her to take office has been canceled out, not only by this reform, but by the fact that the more people and, and for everybody from investors to foreign government officials, the more they learn about it, the less they like it, and also concerns over the way it was approved. What's your sense? Do you get that from the communities that you speak to as well? Absolutely. I speak a lot with uh, Mexican entrepreneurs, Mexican investors, large companies, small companies, also investors from abroad, investors in New York, investors here in the, in the UK where I'm based now. And definitely there's a huge concern. There's a huge concern and there is need to understand better what happened and, and how far uh, this is going to go and understand more what uh, is Claudia Sheinbaum and her new government thinking about the secondary regulations that are actually going to be implementing this huge structural change in the judiciary. What I think about the judiciary reform is that there was a diagnose that was correct. There was no justice, full justice in Mexico. There were, were many lags. There were many uh, shortages in terms of access to justice. There was corruption. There was a, a system that, that uh, in some aspects worked. For instance, the career of judges, the, the institutions that trained judges, that, that uh, oversaw the conduct of judges. But at the same time, justice was not something that was lived on a daily basis by Mexicans. That is true. So the diagnosis was good. And speaking in sort of medical terms, so the, the diagnosis was in the right direction, but you gave a medicine that is almost killing the patient. So the question is, are you going to give palliatives? Are you going to implement it in a, such a gradual way that you will sort of give more certainty or a bit more certainty around the, the next steps and the sort of devil is in the detail implementation uh, part of things. But there, I think there was a huge damage to confidence uh, in relation to investments, in relation to rule of law, and in relation, Brian, to the Supreme Court of Justice being a backstop towards unconstitutional reforms in the last six years. So that backstop is feeling to have been lost. And that is a very important element to consider when you analyze risks in Mexico. No, So so again, yes, the implementation is going to be key, but the fact that the reform was passed as such, I think is a, a, a matter of huge concern for Mexicans and for investors. I've heard two main concerns about this reform. One is that it will, by its nature, concentrate power in Morena, in part because of the logistics of this. You know, to ask a Mexican voter to go in and select from this list of more than a thousand people to say who should be judges at both the federal and more local levels is, I mean, it's basically impossible. And so what they're going to be relying upon is a list that is given to them by the party. And so you end up with judges who will owe their position to a political party. Loyalists on robes, as I call them. <laughs> Loyalists with robes, right. And of course, just to acknowledge here that we have a judicial system here in the U.S. that also has partisan characteristics. But I think that particularly given the, the amount of power that Morena has right now in practical terms, that, that frightens some people. And then the other 
The other issue is you know, the concerns that organized crime uh, could use their influence and funding to ensure that they have co-opted uh, judges, particularly at the local level. Well, what do you think? I mean, are those your concerns as well? Is there anything else that is of concern as we look at this? Those are my concerns as well, definitely. And the fact that there is a creation of a sort of Supreme Court on top of a Supreme Court, which is the behavioral tribunal that is being created. It's an institution that is going to be in charge of overseeing the actions of judges and magistrates and justices of the Supreme Court. So the, the pressures in order for the decisions to be politicized and politically led are enormous, no? And the fact that there is an overseeing authority that can actually uh, remove you from your position according to the decision that you took, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good idea and it's the right incentive in the right direction. So that is also something that, that concerns me. And the fact that, yes, there's many places around the world, like the U.S., that elect some officials for the judiciary power, but not the Supreme Court of Justice. So we would be one of only two countries doing that, and let alone doing that for more than 1,700 different officials from the judiciary. So all of that creates a huge concern and increases the risks in terms of, of um, an adequate rule of law in Mexico. Final question here, uh, Vanessa, about the judicial reform. Some people talk about it as part of a broader story of the erosion of Mexican democracy. Others say, uh, yeah, maybe it's a bad reform, but look, let's not lose perspective here. This is still a country where, you know, we have open elections, where the opposition can do and say whatever it wants, where people are free to criticize Lopez Obrador and Morena and Claudia Sheinbaum in the media. And as a matter of fact, they say the media are, is very dominated by anti-Morena voices. How do you see it? I mean, how how concerned are you about Mexican democracy more generally? I definitely think that there is an attempt to undermine uh, democratic institutions in Mexico by several interests, by several movements uh, in the political system. I would disagree a bit on how much uh, it, it is easy and, and the, um, you know, you can actually criticize the government in a free way being uh, from the press, because we have had examples in the last six years where the president discloses in fiscal information of people from the media, where the president is constantly, you know, going against detractors and conservatives, as he calls them. And, and uh, I think that is a very powerful position to criticize the media from. And also the fact that you're disclosing a private information that is protected by the law does not necessarily create the right incentives for the media to be open and to be able to criticize in a free manner the power, which is what they are there for. So I, I think that that has been undermined, as well as the fact that there is a proposal to basically take away the independent nature of certain independent and technical institutions that I think will undermine, of course, as well, the democratic infrastructure of Mexico that was built for the last four decades. No, So that and, and militarization, Brian, let's not forget that there's a huge militarization in the country. In the past, security was civil, now is militarized. But not only that, now uh, the military is in customs, is in the ports, is building airports, is building a refinery, is administering an airport. So all of that is definitely undermining democratic checks and balances and democratic institutions in Mexico. It is fair to say and is very evident. We'll be back after a short break. It is the event of the year in Miami for investors and business leaders who are interested in Latin America. The Council of the Americas Symposium and Bravo Business Awards will be held this year on October 30th. This year's honorees include Paula Santilli, the CEO of PepsiCo Latin America, Martin Migoya, the co-founder and CEO of Globant, who will receive an award on behalf of his company, and many more. For more information, have a look at the Council of the Americas website. That's as-coa.org. One of the most frequent analyses I heard of Lopez Obrador 
was that he was trying to turn Mexico back to the Mexico of the 1960s and 1970s, the Mexico that he grew up in, the Mexico of one party rule, the Mexico where oil was king, a Mexico that was by many measures safer um, than it is today and that it has been in recent years. What in your mind does Claudia Sheinbaum see as her goal? What do you think guides her at the most fundamental level? I think that she will have a lot of pressure being the first woman ever to be president of Mexico. I myself have been not in her shoes, but in the shoes of the first woman ever to be under secretary of finance of Mexico. And you have the pressure to perform because you are the first one. No, So you're not only being tested because you're a professional and you're there because you're a politician and you're there, but because you are the first woman ever to be there. So I think that legacy and that pressure will sort of follow her, will promote her, but will also haunt her in many occasions, no? because you, she has to raise to the challenge. So having said that, I think that she needs to deliver a, a country in which you need to grow. If she wants to still uh, maintain the sort of more populistic approach of uh, social programs and increasing the minimum wage. Remember that with López Obrador, social programs, back in 2018, social programs accounted for 8 billion U.S. This year, an electoral year, they went up to 30 billion U.S. So much more social programs, much more cash transfers, social expenditure, and at the same time, increasing the uh, minimum wage in almost 150 percent adjusted by inflation. So if you still want to follow that sort of populistic approach, you need resources and you won't have resources if you're running the largest fiscal deficit in 36 years, if you want to consolidate public finances passing from 6% this year to 3% next year, you're going to be very tight. And most importantly, growth is de decelerating in Mexico. The Central Bank of Mexico had the expectation of growth this year for 2.5%, and now it reduced it to 1.5%. Next year, uh, 2025, it had the expectation of 1.5%. Now it's 1.2%. So there's a clear deceleration there. Where are you going to get more resources from if you're not creating the conditions domestically and the conditions to attract more investment in order to grow? So in order to be a techno-populist government, if you want to add technocracy to it, and if you want to add the populistic approach to it, you must grow and you must have enough resources to finance the programs you want to finance. And this was one of my takeaways when I was there in July, was you talked to all these people, especially supporters of Morena, who said she's going to build out the healthcare system, she's going to improve schools, she's going to improve infrastructure. And my thought was, that sounds great, but where's the money going to come from? Because on the revenue side, if it doesn't come from growth, it is true that Mexico's you know, tax take as a percentage of GDP is, is below the Latin American average. But she has seemingly ruled out a tax reform that might produce more revenues. And so as somebody who watched the fiscal crisis following the transition from Lula to Dilma Rousseff uh, 14 years ago, which I see a lot of echoes, um, what ultimately caught up with Dilma Rousseff was that two things, she did not have the political skills and charisma of the founder of the movement, Lula, um, but also she inherited a fiscal situation that was difficult and was just not able to meet the expectations that had been raised in prior years. To be fair, at the larger scope, debt to GDP ratio in Mexico is pretty sustainable, 50% of GDP, vis-a-vis -vis pairs like Brazil that you are mentioning or India that are around 80%, it looks good. But if you don't give an adequate narrative to that history, you're not going to get away with it without the credit rating agencies to open their eyes and perhaps taking actions. No, And one story there that needs to be shifted significantly is Pemex. So Pemex needs to be given viability. Pemex needs to focus on profitability. And that change could give a you know, good um, fresh air for public finances in Mexico. But you need to design a, a plan for Pemex to be profitable. Vanessa, in the context of this economic discussion, I want to ask you specifically about nearshoring. 
this is an area where there has been so much expectation and so much hype. But if you look at the numbers, what has happened so far appears to be somewhat less than that. In fact, the FDI numbers in Mexico in percentage terms are at their lowest level in 10 years. What do you see happening? The companies that you speak to, are they on hold right now or are they simply looking elsewhere to places like Vietnam and other spots in Asia that that get them outside China, but offer them safer environments, safer in terms of both political risk as well as, I suppose, organized crime as well? Yes, I don't think nearshoring should be a nice wish. In order for you to actually have nearshoring as a reality, you need to build the elements for nearshoring to happen. No, you need to build rule of law. You need to build certainty. You need to build a uh, public investment. You need to build fiscal policy. You need to build a series of incentives for that to happen. So, so my answer would be twofold. Both things are happening. There are opportunities that we're missing and that are going elsewhere, mainly in Southeast Asia, but also in Latin America. And there's also some other companies and some other businesses around the world that are just putting their investments on hold in waiting to see what Claudia's true colors are and what the government will be all about. So I think if we really want to be one of the nearshoring places in the world, we need to pass from having it as a nice idea to doing things to actually attracting investment in Mexico. Let's talk about the relationship with Mexico and the United States. Um, arguably the most important diplomatic relationship that Washington has, um, probably the most important diplomatic relationship that Mexico City has. There have been some tensions in the last couple of weeks, in part because of the judicial reform. The U.S. ambassador to Mexico, Ken Salazar, expressed concern over it. That led to Lopez Obrador saying he was pausing Mexico's relationship with the U.S. How do you think Claudia Sheinbaum will navigate this bilateral relationship in the weeks and months ahead? Two comments there. The first one is that I think that U.S.-Mexico's relationship is very structural too structured. And it is not given only by the relationship with between Mexico City and Washington. It's too deep. So the relationship that it implies $1.4 million trade per minute, eh, it's about states, it's about municipalities, it's about big private sector, it's about small private sector, it's about infrastructure, it's about water, it's about migration, it's about borders. It is too deep, too intense, too complex. So that will be maintained. And of course, we can expect some frictions around migration, some frictions around uh, uh, security, around uh, um, organized crime and fentanyl, and, and tensions around USMCA revision as it approaches 2026. But it will still be there. Uh, uh, and, and I think we're going to listen to a lot of noise now in the middle of the US election. But volatility would be most likely short term. And I think uh, both will find the channels to have a productive relationship, to have a productive dialogue, as it has been the history in the past. But I don't exclude any tensions in the in the horizon, which we will have for sure. And this uh, judiciary reform will give one uh, excuse for that those tensions to be exacerbated for sure, no, but there will be many more in the horizon. And the most important is how we can create a, in North America the most competitive region in the world, because we can actually be the most competitive region in the world, vis-a-vis -vis industrial policy, vis-a-vis -vis subsidies, vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think uh, um, uh, the content and national content and rules of origin is going to be a very technical, but a very important, uh, politically speaking, dialogue within that dynamic and as the uh, revision in 2026 of the USMCA approaches. I've been speaking to people in both countries who are a little more concerned, <laughs> a little more worried, uh, who are saying, look, under either US president, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, there will be some tensions as part of this UMCA renewal process in part because of the presence of uh, Chinese vehicles now in Mexico, which uh, some in the U.S. see as kind of a back doorway for China to get its vehicles into the United States, um, but because of other challenges as well as judicial reform. 
But let's not pretend that the risks are equal with both candidates. Let's talk about Donald Trump. Um, he has been advocating for increased tariffs across the board, uh, as you know, and recently said that he wanted a 200% tariff on Mexican autos. Uh, that's a recent statement. This is in addition to things that he said about his mass deportation agenda. The idea of unilateral military action by the United States has become a somewhat mainstream Republican idea. There are questions about whether Donald Trump would respect Claudia Sheinbaum the same way that he respected Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. I mean, how do you think that those are all or mostly kind of atmospheric in nature, or do you see real risk of a rupture there? No, I don't see risk of a rupture, but I see risk of a lot of tensions. And the tension that is more risky for Mexico is anything in relation to USMCA. When I was deputy minister of finance, Trump was candidate and then Trump was president. So the difficulty there was to distinguish noise from reality. But noise creates volatility and noise creates uncertainty in Mexico. And noise sometimes this anchor uh, certainty around Mexico and, and investing in Mexico. So that will happen for sure, having Trump as candidate. And then whatever the outcome of the uh, election in the U.S. is, I think it's going to be a tough relationship. Don't get me wrong. I, I see tensions in the horizon. I see volatility happening. What I don't see is a fracture that actually puts into question the density, the, the depth, the complexity, and the intensity of the bilateral relationship. Because let's let's be serious here. I mean, we're the, still the first trading partner of the U.S., no? And, and, and no one is going to do measures to shoot themselves on the foot. But there's interests, there's, there's power, and there's going to be tensions along the way, for sure. But there has to be uh, spaces to, to channel those tensions and to have a positive dialogue as we have seen in the last six years, honestly. I have to recognize that most of us got it wrong the first time around with Trump. And specifically, you know, we all expected that there was going to be this hostile relationship between Trump and AMLO. We had reasons to believe this. Uh, you know, AMLO wrote a book during the campaign called Oye Trump <laughs> that was amounted to a huge rant against Trump. But then when they ended up in office at the same time, um, uh, it's probably an exaggeration to say that they were friends, but they they did seem to respect each other and figured out that they could have a transactional relationship and they figured out how to do it. On the other hand, during his first term, Trump had people in his cabinet and in the White House who were willing, maybe not to tell him no, but to diffuse certain ideas such as closing down the border, something that he... Uh, reportedly wanted to do several times. So we'll see, <laughs> I guess is kind of the, the bottom line. We'll see many peaks in tensions. And, and I think they're going to be administrated at the end, but tensions are going to be there for sure. But as a final question, you sound on balance a bit more optimistic about where Mexico is headed than some of the people that I've been talking to. Am I reading you correctly? And if so, what do you think the country is going to look like two or three years down the road under Claudia Sheinbaum? In, in my analyst head, I usually try to be balanced, fair, and as realistic as I can be. That has nothing to do with the way my heart feels and the way my expectations or ideas would, would be, you know, perhaps different in many ways. But uh, in this tenor, I think there's going to be significant risks. The concentration of power that I referred to, militarization, uh, the uh, undermining of democratic institutions and checks and balances, all of that, I think, should be a matter of worry because that creates uh, uncertainty. When decisions are not based on the rule of law, and on international laws and standards and domestic laws and standards and institutions. And they're best based on what people decide at a certain moment, no? Whether it's sunny or it's raining or I feel good or I feel bad. I don't think that's that's the right course of action. Having said that, I think that uh, Claudia Sheinbaum has the opportunity to change policy and to shift 
policy in in ways in which it is going to change the relationship with the private sector, which was something that was significantly uh, affected during the last six years. And in the hope that that can create a better uh, scheme for investment and for hopefully growth, because at the end, what we want for our country is for people to be better off and for uh, Mexicans to, you know, eat three times a day, have a good job, have a good salary and be able to to thrive. So, so I have my hopes, but still, I think we need to see what we see in Claudia Sheinbaum as leader, what we see in Claudia Sheinbaum in terms of her priorities and the companions of travel that she will have with her in order to implement her her plan of government. No, There will be huge challenges ahead, huge headwinds, but also I think they can create also tailwinds that can help out in this process. Vanessa, thanks so much for joining us on the AQ Podcast. My pleasure always. Thank you for listening to the America's Quarterly Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review, give us a rating, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The America's Quarterly Podcast is produced and edited by Luisa Franco. Our sound engineer is Gabriela Baez.